Live on purpose. Stay connected. You're listening to Yumi Radio and it's now 7 o'clock in the a.m. and time for the news headlines. Um, So let's see what's in the headlines today. And let me just say thank you so much for joining me this morning and for those persons who who are coming, who are returning because you are here with me. You were here with me before. I would just like to say thank you. Thank you for your support and your kindness and your thoughts. Uh, One moment, please. Thank you for being here. I know there are many other things you could be doing right now, but you're here with me, so thank you so much. Okay, so the New York Times, all the news that's fit to print. Uh, In the news today, early sunshine, then clouds high 43 and tonight will be cloudy some rain and snow low 33 and tomorrow blustery periodic sunshine some flurries high 41 and you can read the rest of the weather you can see the weather map on page c8 it's january 7 2020 and the picture that's on The picture, the photo that's on the front page of the New York Times. Oh my gosh. It's an ocean of people. Like, I mean, a whole flood of people. And um, it's the funeral, the funeral procession for Major General Kasim Soleimani who was killed last week in an American drone strike crowded into NG Lab Square in Tehran on Monday. That's E N G H E L A B. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Wow. The photo is just so, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Man, this is worth a million words. Wow. There's so, like every where you can see where there isn't a building it's people like there is no space there's no plot of ground that you can actually see it's all people and they're holding up flags and you can see monitors um for persons to be able to see what is happening and then there's this in the center there's this dome like thing that is blue and you can see some persons standing on it as i suspect that is where that's the hub or the podium from which they're speaking. Um, But this is what is happening. And it's so interesting because the people, when you look at the people outside of the flags and the colors of the flag, it's just dark. It's almost like everyone is wearing black or something. It's just dark. Wow. It's, um, yeah. Um, In other headlines... Bolton, in twist, offers to testify at Trump's trial. McConnell faces choice. Fresh fresh pressure on GOP to allow witnesses on impeachment. And this story is by Nicholas Nicholas Fandos and Michael Schmidt out of Washington. John R. Bolton, the former White House National Security Advisor, said on Monday that he was willing to testify at President Trump's impeachment trial, putting new pressure on Republicans to call witnesses and raising the public the possibility of revelations as the Senate weighs in weighs Mr. Trump's removal. Mr. Bolton's surprise declaration in a statement on his website was a, dem- was a dramatic turn that could, al- that could alter the political dynamic of the impeachment process in the Senate and raise the risk for Mr. Trump of Republican defections. The former National Security Advisor is a potential vital witness with direct knowledge of presidential actions and conversations regarding Ukraine that could fit that could fill in the blanks in the narrative of the impeachment case. 
It came as the House continued to withhold the articles of impeachment necessary to start the trial in a bid to increase democratic leverage in Senate negotiations over calling Mr. Bolton and three other administration witnesses the President blocked from testifying in the House inquiry. And this is what Mr. Bolton said in a statement. I have concluded that if the Senate issues a subpoena for my testimony, I am prepared to testify. His decision raised immediate questions for Senator Mitch McConnell, Republican of Kentucky, around how to proceed with the trial. He has steadfastly refused to commit to, commit to calling witnesses, but as majority leader, he must also weigh the wishes of a small group to moderate Republicans who may press to hear from them. That story continues on A15. Mourners jam streets as Iran warns US troops, um, quote, are within reach. Oh, as they warn, US troops are within reach. Pentagon rules out strikes on antiquities. Washington, this is from Washington and it's by Peter Baker and Maggie Haberman. Defense Secretary Mark T. Esper sought to douse an international outcry on Monday by ruling out military attacks on cultural sites in Iran if the conflict with Tehran escalates further despite President Trump's threat to destroy some of the country's treasured icons. Mr. Esper acknowledged that striking cultural sites with no military value would be a war crime, putting him at odds with the president, who insisted such places would be legitimate targets. Mr. Trump's, tr Mr. Trump's threats generated condemnation at home and abroad, while deeply de de discomforting American military leaders who have made a career of upholding the laws of war. Open quote, we will follow the laws of armed conflict, Mr. Esper said at a news briefing at the Pentagon when asked if cultural sites would be targeted, targeted as the president had suggested over the weekend. When a reporter asked if that meant, in quote, no, because the laws of war prohibit targeting cultural sites, Mr. Esper agreed, that's the laws of armed conflict. The Fuhrer was a classic controversy of Mr. Trump's creation, the apparent result of an impulsive threat and his refusal to back down in the face of criticism. When Mr. Trump declared on Saturday that the United States and identified 52 political targets in Iran, if, it's, if it retaliates for the American drone strike that killed Major General Qasim Soleimani, None of those targets qualified as cultural sites, according to an administration official who asked not to be identified correcting the president. Nonetheless, when Mr. Trump casually said on Twitter that they included sites, in quote, open quote, very high level of importance to Iran and the Iranian culture, close quote, the resulting uproar only got his back up. Rather than simply say that cultural sites were not actually being targeted, the official said he decided to double down the next day with reporters flying with him on Air Force One, scoffing at the idea that Iran could, open quote, kill our people, end quote, while, open quote, we're not allowed to touch their cultural sites, end quote, saying, open quote, it doesn't work that way, end quote. The rest of this story can be read on, on page A6. Oh, man. Um, Ayatollah said to have demanded a direct attack on Americans. And this story is, from, is written by Farnaz Fasihi and David Kirkpatrick. In the tense hours following the American killing of a top Iranian military commander, the country's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, Kamini, Kamini, 
made a rare appearance at a meeting of the government's National Security Council to lay down the parameters for any retaliation. It must be a direct and proportional attack on American interests, he said, openly carried out by Iranian forces themselves. Three Iranians familiar with the meeting said Monday, it was a start. It was a startling departure for the Iranian leader leadership since the establishment of the Islamic Republic in 1979. Tehran had almost always cloaked its attacks behind the actions of proxies it it had cultivated around the region. But in the few regenerated by the killing of the military commander, uh, Major General Qasim Soleimani, a close ally and personal friend of the supreme leader, the Ayatollah, was willing to cast aside those traditional cautions. The nation's anger over the commander's death was on vivid display Monday as millions of Iranians poured into the streets of Tehran for a funeral procession and Mr. Khamenei wept openly over the coffin. After weeks of furious protests across the country against corruption and misrule, both those who had criticized and those who had supported the government marched together, united in outrage. Subway trains and stations were packed with mourners hours before dawn, and families brought children carrying photographs of General Soleimani. A reformist politician, Sadeg Karazi said he had not seen crowds this size since the 1989 funeral of the Islamic Repub Republic's founder, Ayatollah Ruhola Khomeini. We, open quote, we are ready to take a fierce revenge against America, General Hamid Sarkilai of the Revolutionary Guard declared to the throng. Open quote, American troops in the Persian Gulf and in Iraq and Syria are within our reach. That story can be read on page A7. We're reading from the New York Times. In other headlines, new charges for Weinstein as trial starts. And this story is by Jan Ransom and Jose Del Real. One woman ran into Harvey Weinstein at a Hollywood film festival in February 2013. Later that night, he showed up at her hotel room, gained entry, and raped her, she said. He threatened her life, she, took, told, she told the authorities. A day later, Mr. Weinstein met the second woman at a hotel restaurant in West Los Angeles and invited her and another woman up to his room. There he trapped her in a bathroom, grabbed her breasts, and masturbated, masturbated prosecutors said. Those two allegations were contained in a criminal complaint released in Los Angeles on one of the most remarkable days since revelations about the movie producer's sexual harassment of women set in motion the global hashtag MeToo movement. Only hours before prosecutors in Los Angeles unveiled the new case against Mr. Weinstein, he had hobbled with a walker into a courtroom in Manhattan for a hearing on the eve of his long-anticipated rape trial there. Jury selection was to begin on Tuesday, and that story can be continued. That story continues on page A20. In other headlines, Democrats flush, flush with power, race to make laws in Virginia by, Thomas, by Timothy Williams. Virginia Democrats, who hold full control of state government for the first time in a generation, want to ban assault-style rifles. They want to get rid of statues honoring Confederate leaders in dozens of Virginia cities. They intend to give undocumented people licenses to drive, and they want to do it all in the next 60 days. As legislators around the nation return to state capitals this month for a new season of lawmaking, they are expected to veer in starkly partisan directions, to the left and to the right, with only a single legislator in Minnesota under 
under divided control, most states seem certain to keep up a pattern of adopting sharply conservative policies when held by Republicans and deeply liberal ones when run by Democrats. That story continues on page A16. Discord on Iran reinvigorates Biden and Sanders. And this story is by Sidney Ember and Katie Gluck. And it's coming out of Iowa. Um, hours after an American drone strike killed Iran's top military commander, Joseph R. Biden Jr., stood in a barn-like building in Independence, Independence, Iowa, thundering about the importance of electing an experienced president as America faces tumult abroad and, in quote, maybe, God forbid, end quote, war. About 70 miles away, Senator Bernie Sanders was just as passionate as he denounced military spending and encouraged international diplomacy. Open quote, maybe what we should do, sorry, maybe what we should be doing is figuring out how, as a planet, we work together instead of going to war with each other. End quote, Mr. Sanders told, Mr. Sanders told the crowd on Friday inside a building on the Winnishik County Fairgrounds. Grounds. Earlier in the day, he had emphasized the need to, quote, get our priorities right by investing in issues at home rather than on military action abroad. Amid signs that both Biden and Sanders have found their footing in Iowa after months of being overshadowed here, they are now aggressively seizing on the escalating tensions with Iran to press their, stark, their starkly divergent cases for the presidency as they compete for an overlapping slice of the electorate. That story, of course, continues on page A17. In business news, election meddling in Taiwan, the island is on high alert for digital age trickery that Beijing might be using to try to swing a crucial vote. Diversity push in economics after a year of disquieting revelations, an annual meeting, meeting showed progress, but also work to be done. In international news, charred beyond, beyond imagining, residents in some, some lush rural places in New South Wales, Australia, thought the raging fires would never reach them. They were wrong. And in national news, an overlooked danger, the increase in after-school shootings at or, next, sorry, at or near sporting events has largely gone unnoticed. Quake strike Puerto Rico, a 5.8 magnitude tembler, damaged homes and destroyed a popular coastal rock formation. That story continues on page A18. Um, in New York, limits of a court for sex work. Six years after New York created human trafficking intervention courts, some say the system isn't living up to its promise. And um, in sports, final headline is fighting over children's safety. Puerto Rico is introducing major regulations to rein in the pressure of youth sports. Some adults, including parents, are thrilled about it. And that story can be, that, that story continues on page B7. So that is the news headlines from the New York Times, all the news that's fit to print. Now let's look at uh, migra some migration trends. The, and this is from the Migration News Desk. Um, from the International Organization of My Migration, IOM, and we're reading from their website. Um, the first headline set, reads, Anniversary Song Marks 10 Years Since Haiti Earthquake. Second one is, Hearing Aids Let a Yemeni Child Return to School. And um, from the Brussels Times, 1,283 people died trying to reach Euro by sea in 2019, over a 1,000 fewer than the 2,299 who died crossing the Mediterranean in 2018, said IOM. 
And from the New York Times, migrants crossing the English Channel to the UK increased sixfold in 2019, despite stepped-up patrols. And from the UN News, some 24 million bamboo poles have been harvested for construction in Bangladesh's Cox's Bazaar refugee settlement, thanks to support from IOM. And in the Sarajevo Times, Bosnian women knit winter socks for migrants. And in the quote of the day, um, the quote is from UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. Um, As we enter the new year, the world needs young people to keep speaking out, applying pressure and pushing boundaries to have us protect our planet and improve the lives of its people. And that is the news roundup today. I promised you yesterday to share with you the remain the next 10 um, you, uh, migration trends. Um, I share global migration trends. Yesterday, I shared 10 with you. And today, I'll just share the remaining 10. There are 20 in total. So number 11, trafficking and modern slavery. 25 million victims of forced labor were estimated in 2016. Out of those, 5 million may have crossed an international border. Number 12, migrant smuggling. 2.5 million irregular migrants were smuggled for an economic return of U.S. dollars 5.5 to 7 billion in 2016. Hmm. Number 13 returns. 72,176 volunteers returns were assisted by IOM in 2017 worldwide. 14 integration and well-being. 6.7 trillion contribution. Migrants contributed 6.7 trillion US dollars to global GDP in 2015, a share of 9.4% of the total global GDP that year. This is imp- in important information because this is not data that's talked about. Um, number 15, children, 14% children. In 2017, children represented 14% of the stock of international migrants. Number 15A, women. In 2017, women represented 48.8% of the stock of international migrants. And number 16 is environment. 18.8 million people in 135 countries were newly displaced by sudden onset disasters within their own countries in 2017. Number 17, governance. 39 countries have taken part in IOM's Migration Governance Indicators project as of 2018. And number 18, potential migration. 66 million adults, or 1.3% of the world's adult population had planned to move permanently to another country in the next 12 months in 2015. 19. Public opinion. 22% of the world's population is generally more likely to want national immigration to be kept at its present level, 22%, or increased, 21%, rather than decreased, 34% in 2015. And the last data is migration data capacity. 87, over 87 countries asked about country of birth. 75% asked for citizenship, citizenship and 50% for the year or period of arrival in their 2010 censuses. You're listening to Yumi Radio and this is the Yumi Radio Morning Show. And we are, during the morning show, we always share with you what's in the headlines using the um, New York Times, as well as looking at migration trends because travel is such a huge huge business and migration is one of the most topical issues right now impacting people's lives. And so that's something we do. And, and what we also do is look at consumer trends, business trends, and what the data is saying to share with you so that you can be in the awareness of the time. Um, so today in um, consumer slash business trends, we are 
looking at um, Forbes um, Decade in Review, and this was written by Thomas Brewster. Um, the 10 Hacks of the Decade is the title. And the first one that they're looking at, the DNC breach. Russia's attack on American democracy in 2016 peaked with a lack of demo with the hack on Democrats and the leaks of their internal communications. The second is Equifax owned. This 2017 breach was huge with at least 143 million affected globally. Credit agencies were a big target throughout the 2010s. OPM's 2015 disaster, data on more than 20 million government employees was stolen. Many had top level security clearances, making this a real nightmare scenario. U Ukraine power out. Russian hackers took down a power supply in 2015. It was unprecedented at the time. Yahoo's 1 billion breach. From 2014, this was the definitive mega breach. It's not yet been topped in terms of numbers. The San Bernardino iPhone. When the feds asked Tim Cook's company to come up to open up an iPhone, they started a war between not just Apple and the FBI, but between Silicon Valley and the American government. It continues today. Targeted, sorry, target, targeted. Oh, target, that's <laughs> in the company. Target, targeted. The t this 2013 attack led to a leak of up to 40 million credit cards. That's a cyber criminal's dream. Sony drama. North Korea hacked Sony because of a Seth Rogen film. It was a saga worthy of a Hollywood script itself. Stuxnet espionage. These were unprecedented attacks on Iran's nuclear enrichment plants discovered in 2010. The US and Israel were suspected attackers. And finally, Ashley Madison nightmare. This hack exposed users' prurient desires and destroyed lives. That is our roundup of news and headlines and trend and global trends in migration and business for today. We hope that it was informative for you and that you would have become more informed and enlightened by it. Now I'd like to go back to some music. Um, you're listening to Yumi Radio. It's now 7.28 in the morning. Thank you so much for tuning in with us and for staying tuned with us. Mm -hmm.